Eight months ago, we started this process that led to what you are about to see right now. Episode one. Welcome to the Great Camera Shootout 2011. By far, one of the greatest camera evaluations to date. The testing this year was a huge undertaking. We asked Robert Prime's ASC to design and administer his own tests. That's right, we didn't want people to think that these tests were biased in any way, and they're not. So Bob created the Single Chip Camera Evaluation, or SCCE, an independent organization to conduct the testing. Our documentary is about the process that Bob took to design and conduct his tests. And what you'll see is quite a bit different than what we did last year. Bob designed the tests with his technicians. Bob ran the tests with zero Zucuto involvement. Bob picked his crew, and Bob picked the cameras to be tested. So essentially, there were two crews on the set, our Zacuto documentary crew and Bob's SCCE crew. Last year, the testing only focused on DSLRs because they were new and nobody really knew much about them. But a lot of guys chimed in and asked, why didn't you include the red? And the reason is because it was a DSLR test. These tests are incredibly complicated and last year we just wanted to test DSLRs against film. This year, we have a different mission to test what we like to call cinema cameras. You know, cameras you could potentially use to shoot a feature or a short. One criteria we decided on was that these were to be large sensor cameras that could only come from the manufacturer's pro line and not from the consumer divisions. Again, it was Bob's call and he had the final say on what cameras were included. We're testing the Sony F35 and the Arri Alexa. The red one with the MX sensor. At the time, the Epic was not available to us. Believe me, we begged for it. The Sony F3. The Panasonic AF100. 35 millimeter film, Kodak stocks 5219 and 5213. The Phantom Flex and Weiss Cam HS2. The Canon 1D Mark IV, 5D Mark II, and 7D. And the Nikon D7000. Bob and his team designed 15 different tests that really stressed these cameras. Here's the deal. Of course we could have made every camera look great in each test. That's not the point of this camera comparison. The point is to show in a stress scenario how well each camera can perform against the other. So I don't want to hear, I know I can make my camera look better because with proper lighting, we know you can. Plus a great TP can make any of these cameras look amazing in any of these situations. They shot a combination of scientific charts and real world scenes. Both are necessary in making a meaningful evaluation. Also, a lot of steps were taken to be as fair as possible. Each test used the same PL mounted lens for all the cameras, except the D7000 which was not available with a PL mount. So it used Zeiss ZF glass. For the most part, we used the Fujinon 4K rated zooms. All the manufacturers were invited to be involved with the tests and provide a technician with their camera. In the cases where a manufacturer declined to send somebody, Bob assigned a camera master to manage that camera as it rotated through all the tests. Each test also had a station chief who kept the tests consistent between cameras and a dedicated team of data wranglers under the direction of Mike Curtis and Bill Hogan to manage all the media. A lot of people say everything looks good on the web. Now we have taken great care to compress this documentary so that you can really see the details. So don't get pissed if this show takes a while to load. Like last year, we wanted to give you the cinema experience. And we do this in an interesting way, by allowing you to hear comments from viewers in theatrical screenings, which we held in Sydney, Amsterdam, New York, London, NAB, and Hollywood. You'll hear from indie and feature filmmakers, event shooters, commercial DPs, directors, and corporate filmmakers. Even though you aren't seeing this in a 2K theater, hearing from people in the ASC, BSC, ACS, CSC, NSC, 
ICG, and the SOC should help you evaluate the cameras as they did and give you the theatrical experience on the web. The tests that we'll see in episode one deal with dynamic range and latitude. We'll see an airy dynamic range test chart shot by Michael Bravin. And we'll see a pair of scenes that test underexposure and overexposure. These scenes were lit by Matt Siegel and Nancy Schreiber ASC. These scenes will help us see the usable latitude of each camera. But first we need to know, what is dynamic range? A camera's dynamic range is the difference between the darkest object a camera can photograph and the lightest. And what we're doing in this station is we're measuring dynamic range. The practice behind this is that there's a piece of motion picture film behind it that's checked for the densitometer. And what you do is you set the exposure for the camera and where you lose detail in the vertical and horizontal lines is your clipping point. And where you lose detail because of noise in the shadow areas is your lowest exposure in your black area. And in between, you end up finding the number of stops at dynamic range. Now let's see the actual test footage from these cameras. Jack Holm from Tarkus Imaging took these raw files from this test and computed these dynamic range numbers for each of the cameras. But the numbers only tell part of the story. There's a difference between calculated dynamic range and what we would call usable exposure latitude. I was surprised that the F3 and the 5D Mark II uh, delivered the same amount of latitude at 11.2 stops. The um, 5D, I rate it more at 10. Yeah. You know, to be honest, just to be safe. I mean, to me, personally, 11 stops, 11.2 stops is a little bit uh, generous. On the other hand, I think um, the Alexa, I mean, 14.1, I, I found when Tony and I did tests, we, we, um, we found actually far more um, latitude in the Alexa than we did on, um, on film. I was surprised by the Phantom Flex, actually. I always thought of it as just a high-speed camera. I didn't think of it as a camera that you'd actually shoot a lot of other stuff with. Definitely the latitude um, that it had, I didn't expect it to have anything like that. Generally, most of them, you know, from the Sony to the D7000, they're all very, very, very close. Once you get used to the flavor of those as a lighting guy, it seems like you could be, you know, comfortably moving from one to the other. But then when you go back to film, it's a whole different ball game, man. You know, a lot of the cameras up there have the same, I like, I, I don't know if the Canon can see 14, what, what is it, 11 stops. 11. I mean, yeah. 11 stops is certainly not shooting like reversal. Yeah, that's a big amount of latitude. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's the usable versus unusable yeah. latitude. I'm sure you can, you can see a trace of light down there, but. Right, looking yeah, at little white dots on the noise on it, level right, on the okay. floor. Yeah, and, yeah. exactly, because if it's more noise than picture, does it count? We also need to see how these cameras record real scenes. To do this, an underexposed scene and an overexposed scene were designed. The camera master had to set their camera to record the widest dynamic range and they were not allowed to change any settings between the two scenes. The combination of both these scenes will show the usable dynamic range of each camera. The underexposure scene, which was lit by Matt Siegel, was designed to intentionally underexpose the camera. The new technology is pretty exciting out there. Um, what we're finding is that you have cameras that can allow you to be creative. You have the what you see is what you get factor. We've been able to uh, light in a more bold manner. We've been able to take more chances with our images because you can see it right away. Like in this set that's behind me, you know, who in their right mind would light with a practical unit that's 15 watts? You know, shooting film, that's pretty, pretty gutsy. But now the newer technology, the sensitivity that we're gonna see in the cameras in this test, allow us to be pretty bold in our choices, allow us to maybe light with higher contrast, maybe allow characters to go into the darkness a little bit more and take those chances. Um, so it's exciting to be able to push the technology and have pleasant results. Hey Matt, tell us what you got nice cooking here. here. Good to see you. Nice to see you, hello. Hey, hello. Welcome to set three. 
Um, <laughs> we have a nice uh, night interior going here. And um, okay. should we take a look at what's happening on yeah. our set here? let's do it. Here's Claudia, and she settles right here. That's a lovely position. And what we'll be able to do is have a, a base exposure at this point of a 2.0 at ASA 320. So this is gonna be our base that we work from and set all the cameras to a nice standard. And then the right side of the frame is basically four and a half stops underexposed. But what we've done is there's a little LED hiding back there as well, because you want a little bit of separation. Um, we've matched the shadow play back here with her levels on her face. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, again, uh, an F.5 and an F.75. We have the two kinos, and again, very low light levels, just single tube on each of these two footers coming through the glass, and the spot reading on that matches our key. So as we bring up the side of the set, we'll also be able to see as it compares to the mid-tone of the face. We took it down, we took it down, we took it down to really test the cameras, and then we went down to 25 watts. Just too much light. The other thing that's really interesting to see is that we have a little bit of contrast. You know, you have not even a two-to-one ratio on some of these things, where mm -hmm. she depends where she stands. To the eye, you don't really see it. Wow. Right. Now let's see how each of the cameras did with this challenge. It's nice to have a reference point. So in this test, Bob chose the red one is the reference to the other cameras. This does not mean that it performed the best, it's simply a reference. I was impressed with the shadow detail in some of the cameras, which I wasn't expecting to see the shadow detail. I focused on the woman's dress, which was fairly uh, high contrast. It, it seemed monochromatic, black and white. Uh, you almost couldn't see any detail whatsoever. And on the cameras that perform better, I could clearly discern separation between coat and dress. You know, I, th I think it's interesting how about a third of the image was lost in uh, in terms of low light sensitivity and it just became a black charcoal mass with about a third of the cameras and I'm, I'm surprised that that many of them, you know, I think three or four of them really failed to resolve any of that area. We've all come through the digital evolution, I still have expected film to be better than it was. Shadow detail in the film. Yeah, I was surprised at that. Yeah, me too. That surprised, yeah, me. That surprised me. Which would only get worse if you started duping it. I'm um, having shot film for so long. Um, thinking we always had the edge on the on the digital realm, and suddenly seeing the difference in the shadow detail uh, was actually staggering. There's a woman who's in the shadows, and her dress seemed to have more detail with the 7D versus the 5D. 
I was surprised by the performance of the F3. It was sharper in the shadows, it, it was crisper. It, compared to the AF101, I thought it looked a lot better. The new cameras are really handling the low lights well, and as we'll see in uh, the test, they're handling the highlights better. So that was the underexposure, but let's see how the cameras handled overexposure. What we're testing here is that if you have a pretty normally lit scene, maybe a little high key, but pretty normally lit, and you've got something too hot in it, something really, really hot, can the camera hold on to those tones? If you could reach in and grab those tones and bring them down, would they be complete or would they be burned out? So instead of just lighting this so it's perfect for this camera, if we did that, all the cameras would all look the same, and you would say, oh, all the cameras are good, and that's not much of a conclusion. It would not tell you which cameras are better at holding highlights. We want to see the latitude of the camera, so the, the film speed that we use for match challenge, which is how well can you bring up the shadows, and this one, how well can you bring down the highlights, we demand the same film speed to keep everything honest. That tells you the total latitude of the camera. My assignment was to light a day interior, so I asked for blondes, right. and uh, we're testing color white and black, and mm -hmm. then the red. Now, we'll see if the polka dots even resolve on any of the camera. We wanted a lot of hot light, so I have uh, Liko going on her face in the mirror. We just have little spots of light from all these little Likos back there. Then what we do is we make a power window in post and bring it down and see what cameras could handle this mm. amount of overexposure. What I also did, there's one really hot spot right uh, on the camera. Yeah, so yeah left. between the branches. So that's really hot. Mm -hmm. Most of the backdrops, like five steps over, and that was seven and a half steps over key. Right. Let's see how they compare. As a reminder, the window was intentionally overexposed to see how the cameras would handle extreme highlights. The Alexa was chosen as a reference in this scene. Again, it isn't saying it performed best, it's just a reference. There was something that caught my eye, oh, the 7D for some reason. Uh, you could see the details for the 7D, fairly good, but the 5D and the, everything else was totally blown out. And then see that the 7D is better outcome, but then I hear now over someone say that the 7D is belicht standaard onder, waardoor die hier dus beter eruit komt. Ja. Dat ziet er dan leuk daar uit, dan dat ik de neiging heb om zo'n 5D toch veel filmischer, zeker als fotograaf vind ik een 5D door zijn grote chip eigenlijk al veel filmischer overkomen dan een kleinere chip. The lack of highlights in the DSLRs and the, uh, 
is no, just dramatic. marked. Yeah, no, that's. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I'm mainly interested in. Actually, is the clipping that goes on. Yeah. Um, and the Alexa seemed to, the Alexa film rated pretty well. Yeah. Everybody said, you know, the 1D Mark IV has a lot better depth in terms of the darks. Uh, the highlights were gone. I mean, in there, and and the the difference specifically between the three Canon cameras was quite varied in terms of the highs and the lows, which surprised me. I sort of thought they'd be a lot closer together. The thing that always sticks out to me in Scream's video is when the highlights go yellow, and that just that drives me kind of crazy. Uh, and that's what I've liked about the 5D is that it tends to be just kind of stay white. And I, and I saw that in the, like the F3 and the AF100 really bad, it seemed like. I've seen the AF100 do some very awful things with highlights. It was very well behaved here, comparing to what I've seen in the past. And again, strange to see the F3 sometimes look a bit too juicy in places. Some cameras, I think, clip a channel earlier than others. So you, you have a color shift. I've been shooting film forever and I'm, I'm used to that nice gradual roll off and you know going into beautiful highlights and um, that's one thing that I think digital cameras have a ways to catch up yet for the most part. The Alexa looked really good though, yeah. So it, you know, it's, it, we're getting there. A lot of the cameras were really, really pretty poor actually. Um, I think the, the Alexa and the F35 clearly were the best there but obviously I was disappointed with the highlights on the F3, but I love the lowlights. Well, what surprised me was that it was um, not as simple as exposure latitude or dynamic range. A lot of cameras did really well in the highlights, did poorly in the shadows and vice versa, which was really interesting to me. One interesting calculation that Jack Holm did was to see how each of the cameras distributed their dynamic range based on an exposure index rating of ISO 800. You can see how there's no standard as to how much highlight or low light latitude is recorded. The 7D seems to have more recoverable latitude in the, in the highlights than the 5D or the, or the 1D Mark II. And yet, according to their numbers, they actually have more than the, than the 7D, and they're right there with the F35, yeah. which just in highlight roll off, I know is not, is not correct. And you can see it here if you go back to the F35 and compare how, how it recovers, it recovers quite well. En um, wat daar moeilijk aan is, is dat film uh, met zijn sweet spot van 320, dat is de, zijn de stocks die getest zijn, ja. die kun je niet vergelijken met een uh, digitale sensor met een sweet spot die rond de 800 zit. Dus logischerwijs uh, is de gevoeligheid in de highlights en de lowlights, dat zijn appels en peren. Ja. Maar dat is echt een heel technisch dingetje, ja. maar dat is iets wat mag. Yeah, I mean, you know, like video cameras don't handle highlights very well that are blown out. And if we consider how that was shot, they chose a midpoint so that everywhere started in the midpoint. You can go seven stops into the shadows with an F3. You can't go over it very much. Um, so if you'd set your midpoint further down on the slider, then I think if you'd exposed for your highlights, which generally you do in video, you expose for your highlights and, and grade up. You know, the new like F3 and the AF100, although they didn't hold up to the bigger cameras, they're like, you know, one-tenth the price, and they didn't seem like one-tenth the image. So as somebody who, who's going to be shooting with my own gear or relatively inexpensive gear because I don't get the opportunity to, you know, rent an Alexa or something for my projects, I'm very excited about what's coming down the pike here. As professionals who, who are under a budget the whole time, we all need to know these limitations of every camera now. So when a producer says, no, we're going to save 300 quid by shooting it on a 5D, we can fire back and say, no, because it's going to cost us 20 grand extra in the post. There's no one best camera. Uh, there's a million answers and there's a million best cameras. It's the best camera for each particular job, but this helped to uh, point out some of the strengths and weaknesses that each camera has for each uh, individual. Uh, situation that you might be in. The camera you use and the film stock you use, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they're preferences. Mm -hmm. um, but compared to getting a good script, a good director and a good cast, yeah. man, it's it's a fraction of a percent of, mm -hmm. of where you're that's going true. with, with, with right. the result. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, and, and your own interpretation of all those. If, you're, if you have a, you're a great cinematographer and this is the instrument you're using, you don't say, ah, it's a piece of shit, blah, 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 like that. You say, okay, what are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? You work into the strengths of it and you make it look as good as possible. You know, it's not, it's not the instrument. It's, the, it's, it's what you got to say. 
We have two more episodes coming that will cover noise, motion artifacts, resolution, compression, and color. These tests are really interesting and they've never really been done like this before. Those episodes will be coming in July and August. We also need to thank all the companies that really helped put this whole thing together, especially Eric Kessler from Kessler Crane, who was a financial contributor along with Zakudo for this documentary. We also need to thank the hundreds of technicians and volunteers that donated their weekends to put together such an incredible test. The SCCE and the Great Camera Shootout 2011 was a huge undertaking involving thousands of man hours. Additionally, thanks go to the many rental houses in LA, especially Claremont Camera, who donated over $2 million worth of equipment for the six days of production. People need to realize that this is not a winner-take-all type test. Some cameras perform well in certain situations, while others perform well in other situations. Not every camera is right for every job and I think this test shows this very well. It was amazing to see this whole thing come together. This was the biggest production we've ever done. We had a team of producers, two line producers, and hundreds involved. We had four editors working two months making one episode, and graphics teams both in-house, as well as Loren Toth with his team in Romania. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you next month for episode two.
Thank you.